Colossians chapter 3. We will read just verse 1 of Colossians chapter 3, but throughout the week, no doubt, we'll be spending a great deal of time there. I am excited about being here. I'm excited about the week and spending the time in God's Word that we're going to be doing this week. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm uh, preaching in Alabama for the first time in my life, uh, Texas born and raised, and uh, I think, as far as I know, I haven't I had the opportunity to meet a lot of people yet, but I think Kenny may be the only person that I know here, um, so brother, it's all on you, however it goes tonight, so I hope you've saved the best for last in that. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, if you'll read with me, if then you were raised with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. If then you were raised with Christ, here is the basis, the beginning, the motivation for seeking things above, as we're going to be talking about this week. If then, if then you are raised with Christ, when we see and comprehend as best we can what God has done for us by His grace then everything else that we are to be and do as Christians will fall into place. May I suggest that this is not the only place where the Apostle Paul used this condition, used this as the basis for everything else. No, may I suggest that in the book of Ephesians, Paul used this concept of us being saved by God's grace as the starting point, as the motivation of everything else that he says in that book as well. And so I ask you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1 as we discuss that concept of being motivated by grace to seek the things which are above. Ephesians chapter 1. If you'd like to mark your spot there in Ephesians 1, we'll be referring back to a number of verses in chapters 1 and 2 before we go back to the book of Colossians at the very end of the lesson. Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse 3 here in just a moment. Whenever a preacher begins a lesson, there are at least a couple of ways that you might go about doing that. One is to go through all of the pleasantries that, you know, we preachers go through, and all of you laugh politely at that, even the little joke I made, right? The other way is to just jump in with both feet. And may I suggest that that's exactly what the Apostle Paul does in the book of Ephesians? He has something to say, and he cannot wait to say it. In fact... If you were going to sit down and write a letter in the first century, there's a, a very formal way that you might go about doing that. And the vast majority of the epistles that we see in the New Testament follow that kind of order, but not Ephesians. The Apostle Paul mixes up the, the letter writing order in the ancient world to say what it is he wants to, to say. It's as if the Apostle Paul is saying, let's cut through all the fat. Let's cut through all the minutiae. And let's get to what's really important. Can we do that same thing this evening? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to begin reading in verse 3. And I'm going to keep reading until I come to the end of the sentence in Greek. Now... Uh, in your translation, you might have a period before then. That's the English translators trying to help us out a little bit, help Paul out a little bit because of the length of this sentence. But I'm going to keep reading until I come to the end of the sentence in, in Greek, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. In Him... We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times He might gather together in one all things in Christ." both which are in heaven and which are in earth in Him, 
in Him also, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Period. Uh, I don't know if we have any English teachers in the audience. Any English teachers in the audience tonight? My mother was an English teacher, and if a student had turned in a sentence that long, it would be marked up all in red. Greek scholars believe this not just to be the longest sentence in all of the New Testament, it is believed to be the longest sentence in all of ancient Greek literature. The Apostle Paul has something to say and he can't wait to say it. And what it seems that the Apostle Paul wants us to see, what he wants the church in Ephesus to see, are those spiritual realities behind everything else before he can address anything else. The Apostle Paul says, let's talk about what's really important. The spiritual blessings of God's grace in Jesus Christ. As he says there in verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace. Praise God for His glorious grace. Amen? Amen. 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 This is the basis, the motivation for everything else that we do that is of a spiritual nature. We seek things above because of the power of God's saving grace in our lives out of gratitude for what God has done for us. And so, beginning in verse 15, the Apostle Paul prays a prayer on behalf of these brethren. He says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the Spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. What does that mean? Well, he explains it. Verse 18, "...the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you might know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ." when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in that which is to come. And He has put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. The Apostle Paul prays for these brethren, and he prays, verse 18, that the eyes of their understanding, maybe your translation says, the eyes of your hearts might be enlightened. Now the eye is the instrument by which we what? We see, by which we perceive the physical reality around us. But the heart, the understanding, is the instrument by which we see what? by which we can perceive the spiritual realities that are around us. And so the Apostle Paul's prayer for these brethren is that they might see spiritually, that they might understand and see and comprehend as best they can all of these wonderful blessings that they have in Jesus Christ according to God's grace. And may I suggest that my prayer, my prayer for our efforts this evening is exactly the same thing. That the eyes of our understanding might be enlightened and that we might see as very best we can what is, number one, the hope of our calling. What are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe, which is primarily manifested in His raising Jesus from the dead and exalting Him to the right hand of God? And if we can perceive that, well, let's be honest, 
We can't. We can't fully perceive that. But if we get a glimpse of what God has done for us by His grace in Jesus Christ, then we will be motivated to seek things above. Now, after all of that positivity, after all of that grace, chapter 2 seemingly comes out of nowhere. Because the Apostle Paul says in verse 1, And you who were dead in trespasses and sins. Whoa, wait a second. What about, what about all of this grace business? What about all of this blessing business? We are not going to fully comprehend what God has done for us until we see where we were without Him. We cannot fully comprehend God's grace and Christ's blessings until we acknowledge that without those, we were dead in trespasses and sins. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works among the sons of disobedience. And not just you, not just you Alabama folks, us Texas folks too. Not just the Jews, but the Gentiles as well. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, that is habitual practice, children of wrath, just as the others. But thank God for verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy... Because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 8, we have perhaps the most succinct summary of salvation in all the Bible. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Salvation is explained by Paul with just two words. For by grace you have been saved through faith. But what does he mean by those two words? Let's begin with the first one. What is included in grace here? Let me put that another way. When he says we are saved by grace, is that just talking about one thing that God did? In the context of the book of Ephesians, God did a lot of things by His grace, didn't He? It's talking about everything that God did to bring about our salvation. His eternal plan that He had before the foundation of the world was by grace. The working out of that plan through the Old Testament in the family of Abraham, that was by His grace. The sending of Christ Jesus to come and live as a man on this earth was by grace. His sacrifice, His resurrection, His ascension, the sending of the Holy Spirit and the revealed will of God, all of that was by God's grace. And yes, everything that is described in those preceding verses that we read, all of that is by God's grace. And so grace is that one word that summarizes God's part of salvation. In the same way, may I suggest that when he says we are saved by grace through faith, faith is not just talking about belief. Paul is using faith in a general sense to describe everything that is our part of salvation, our response to grace. And yes, it would include believing, but wouldn't it also include trust in God? Wouldn't it include submission to His will and repentance and confession? And yes, baptism? When I study with people, I assume people here are like people back home. The phrase that I hear the most often when I'm studying with people who have some background in, in religion, who are believers in God, and we're talking about what one must do in order to be saved, the phrase that I hear the most often is this. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. 
Now, that sounds pretty good, but, but what is meant by that? Well, often what is meant is that you can put no conditions on God's grace, but that it is through faith alone. And, and I think maybe we see the problem even with that, that even faith alone is a condition if it is something that we must produce. And we know what Jesus said in John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29, when they said to Him, What shall we do that we may do the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe on Him whom He sent. Even that belief is something that we produce, a work in that sense. So if there are conditions on God's gift, why don't we put the biblical conditions on the gift of God's grace? I think we can illustrate this in a couple of different ways. Um, keeping your place there in Ephesians chapter 2, Will you turn back with me to the Old Testament in Joshua chapter 6? Joshua chapter 6. My girls are 7 and 5. And so this is a favorite story in our household, as it is in many of the younger classes. Uh, whenever it's being taught, you can hear the stomping from here, right? It's the story of Joshua as they're about to take the city of Jericho. And beginning in verse 1, what does the text say? Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and its mighty men of, men of valor. Now was that a gift from God? Well, yes, it says He gave it into their hand. But keep reading verse 3. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you shall do for six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. So here's my question. After all of those instructions from God, was it still a gift? Yes. It was a conditional gift. Now, according to some theories of the gift of God's grace, this promise from God where He says, I have given Jericho into your hands, says, number one, that you already have the city and you can't lose it. And number two, no condition could possibly be asked of you because then it would not be a gift. If there's anything you have to do, then it can't be a gift. Uh, but I think we understand that that's not really the case. At least not when we consider things from a physical perspective. When we consider gifts that are given, even big gifts that are given in real life. Um, I like this next example because of who I get to be in this example. Let's imagine for a moment that I am a billionaire philanthropist, all right? I have more money than I know what to do with. And so I'm, I'm here, and I, I know that the campus is right next door, and I did a little research, and I know that y'all have a, a good nursing program here, and I say, let's take that a step further. You know what this campus of UNA really needs? What y'all really need is a medical school and a research hospital to go along with that that's going to be top of the line. The best in Alabama, the best in the South. Forget about Vanderbilt. It's going to be right here. And so I go over to the university and I say, you know what? I want you to build a medical school and a research hospital and I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to give you, let's, let's go big. I'm going to give you two billion dollars and I want it to be the best facility in the world. But my grandfather passed away from cancer. He really did. And he was very, very uh, close to me. He had a great influence on my life. And so all I ask of you in giving you this money is I want you to name the school after him. I want it to be the Van Cash School of Medicine. Now does that condition mean that that $2 billion is no longer a gift? 
I, I say to my high school kids back home, I need to hear your head rattle. So is it this way or this way? That $2 billion, is it no longer a gift because I put a condition on it? No, it's still a really big gift, a really big gift, right? Well, what if they came back to me and they said, you know what, we'll take the $2 billion, but we're not going to name it that. Don't I have every right as the giver of the gift to say, well, if you don't name it that, then I'm not going to give you the $2 billion. Don't I have that right? I, I know this sounds crazy, but, but just go with me on this, okay? Let's imagine, take it a step further, that they do name it that, and they take the money, they build the school, and they get this big sign out there, and it says... The Van Cash School of Medicine, and they step back and they look at that sign and they say, Ooh, look at that sign right there. That is a good looking sign. Have you ever seen a sign that good looking? We earned that $2 billion by putting that sign up there. That's silly, isn't it? From a physical perspective, we can see that. That nothing was earned. But in order for the gift to be accepted, conditions had to be met. Uh, keep your hand in Joshua 6. I've got you, your hand here, your marker here. But turn over to Titus chapter 2 for just a second. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. Titus 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that. Wait a second, God's grace teaches us something. I thought it was a gift. It is. It's a gift that teaches us what we need to do. Teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us. That's grace that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. God's grace has appeared to all men and it teaches us what we must do. And my question is, if God's grace has appeared to all men and there is nothing that we're supposed to do, then why aren't all men saved? We know that God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 tells us that. The reason all men aren't saved is because the conditions of salvation must be met in our response to the Lord's invitation, in response to His grace. And we do so, if we're going to summarize it, in that one word, faith. Faith, true, biblical faith is found in obedience to the conditions of grace. Faith is what we must produce in order to be saved by grace. Go back there to Joshua chapter 6 and verse 20. We see the same thing here. The instructions have been given by God and in verse 20 they do what God called them to do. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Wait a second, they took the city? I thought it was a gift. It is. It is a gift that they took when they fulfilled the conditions, when they fulfilled all of the conditions. And let me ask you, would it have been enough for the Israelites to say, we believe that God has given Jericho into our hands and then do nothing? Would that have been enough? Would that have worked even more? Would that have really been faith? Of course not. They had to take the city. Now let me ask you, did they earn the city in what they did? Was what they did equal to what God did? You ever, you ever wondered why God made them do this, this marching thing and the yelling thing and all of that? I believe He made them do that to show them that it wasn't by their own power and their own might that somehow they earned this and they deserved this. It was to show them that God was the one who was giving them this city. Can you imagine how that conversation went? 
between Joshua and his generals. All right, boys, gather around. Here's the game plan. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We're going to march around the city once for six days. Oh, that sounds good. That'll get them really intimidated. And then on the seventh day, we're going to march around it seven times. Oh, that'll really get them going. And then we're going to blow the ram's horns and shout with a great shout and the walls are going to fall down. Do what? What are we going to do? It was clear that God was the one who gave them this city. But they still had to fulfill the conditions that God placed upon that gift that He was giving them. You know, we see this over and over and over in our Bibles. We see it with Noah in Genesis chapter 6. Obedience, exact, complete, reverent obedience is what we find in Noah. In Genesis chapter 6 in verse 22, in chapter 7 verses 5, 13, and 16, it says that Noah obeyed all that God commanded him to do. But his obedience, his works were in no way in opposition to God's grace before any of that. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8, it says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman, that Syrian general, he comes to Elisha to be healed. And God gives him a great gift. He says, go wash in the Jordan River, dip seven times and you will be made clean from this disease, this leprosy that you have. And what was Naaman's response? He says, we've got better rivers back in Syria. Well, he was right about that. I've seen the Jordan River. We'd call it a dirty old creek back in West Texas. But the power was not in the water. The power was in God. And it was not until he dipped seven times in the Jordan River that he was made clean. We think about in the New Testament, in John chapter 9, that blind man in the pool of Siloam. You remember this account. That's the one where Jesus spit on the ground and he made mud and he put it on his eyes and he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And you can imagine this blind man stumbling down the steps to get to the pool and he washes and he can see again. And what does the text say? He went and washed and came back seeing. Jesus gave this man a great gift. But he was not healed until he fulfilled the conditions that Christ placed upon that gift. And yet still, that concept, the gift of God, salvation by grace through faith, it still bothers some people. And for many, it's because they have ingrained in their thinking from years of teaching that works negate gift status. If there are any works involved, then it's not a gift. And I'll be honest, maybe sometimes our answer to that is not always the best. They say works negate gift status, and we say, no, they don't. Works don't negate gift status. Well, let me ask you, can works negate gift status? Can the conditions that are placed upon a gift become so large, so burdensome, that it's not really a gift anymore? Is that possible? Think about some of the greatest gifts that we might be given. Uh, I asked a group of high school boys, you know, what's the greatest gift somebody could give you? Um, they came up with a bunch of sports cars and so forth, right? It's my illustration. We're going to make it a cherry red Corvette. I want you to imagine, maybe go back, maybe go forward, depending on where you are in life. I want you to go back to graduation day. And I want you to imagine for a moment that your parents or your grandparents, uh, they come to you and they've got this little box and you open it up and in there are a set of car keys. And so you go out into the parking lot and you're hitting the clicker, seeing which one it is, and there, there it is. There's the cherry red Corvette. And so your parents say to you, here's your brand new Corvette, it's bought, it's paid for, we're even going to pay the insurance on it. Is that a gift? Maybe it's not a smart gift, but is it a gift? Absolutely it's a gift. But let's just change one thing about that. Let's imagine for a moment, same box, same excitement, same car keys, same cherry red Corvette, and they say, here's your brand new Corvette. This is all we ask of you. We just want you to pay for half of it. And, and you can pay as you go. Just make payments whenever you can. But we want you to pay for half of this Corvette and it's yours. Is that a gift? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting there, but it's still kind of a gift, right? 
Well, let's imagine for a moment it's the same car keys, the same beautiful car Corvette, and they say, here you go, son. Here's your brand new Corvette. Good luck with the car payments. Good luck with the insurance. She's all yours. Is that a gift? No, that's not a gift. You're going to burden a high school graduate with those kinds of car payments, with, with that kind of insurance payments? And so what we see is that there is a tipping point to where the conditions can become so burdensome in relation to the greatness of a gift that something is no longer a gift. And the bigger the gift is, the more conditions you can place upon it and it still be a gift. Um, in school, I, I enjoyed math, but it took me a while. I had to think everything through, but you gave me something visual, a map or a graph or a chart, that's right up my alley. Um, and so I want to illustrate this tonight uh, with the chalkboard over here. Somebody asked me uh, just before the lesson, how old are you? 74. That's how old I am. Um, I, want to, I want to illustrate it this way. This axis here is the greatness of the gift. From a really small gift down here to a great big gift down there. And this axis is going to be the conditions. From not very many conditions down here to a whole lot of conditions up there. I have a friend back in Texas. His name is Greg. Greg lives in the Houston area. And like me, Greg is a great fan of the San Antonio Spurs who play in the NBA. Um, and a few years ago, when the Spurs were in the NBA Finals playing for the championship in 2014, uh, Greg is such a big fan of the Spurs that on all his work correspondence, his emails, he's got the Spurs logo down there in the corner. And he had one client who is in San Antonio, and he gets an email from this client during the finals, and he says, Greg, I have two tickets to game one of the NBA finals tonight, or tomorrow night. Do you want them? And Greg says, absolutely I want them, right? Right? And so Greg goes and he goes to San Antonio and he picks up the tickets and he shows them to the little usher lady and she just points down. And Greg goes down and he goes down and he goes down and he goes down and he crosses a little velvet rope and he goes down and he ends up sitting in the row behind the Spurs bench. He could have reached out and touched Tim Duncan if he wanted to. He would have gotten kicked out of the game, but he could have done that. Now, just to show you, this is not a preacher story. I didn't make this up. This actually happened. Here is Tim Duncan. That's Greg. <laughs> That's exactly right. It's Greg Byers. And so Greg strikes up a conversation with the guy next to him. And the guy is friendly and he says, hey, you know, where did you get the tickets? And he said, well, this client of mine gave me these tickets. He said, he gave you those tickets? Somebody offered me 10 grand for mine and I said, no. Let me ask you, is that a gift? Uh, that's not a trick question, folks. Is that a gift? Absolutely, that is a great big gift. And if we're going to put it on the greatness scale, we might put those $10,000 Spurs tickets way over there. But are there some conditions on that gift? Absolutely. Greg lives in Houston, so that means he's at least a couple of hours away from San Antonio. And so he has to drive over to San Antonio. He has to take a day off of work. He has to get a hotel room, pay for his meals, all those sorts of things, right? And those, those are pretty big conditions, right? But even if we put the conditions way up here, say there's lots of conditions there, if we plot it out, because the gift is so big, $10,000 Spurs tickets, it's below this line and so it's clearly a gift, right? Does that make sense? I have another friend named Richard who used to attend where we are, but he lives in San Antonio now. Let's imagine for a moment that Richard gives me a call. And he says, Reagan, we hadn't talked in a while. I want to take you to lunch. And I say, Richard, 
That's great. I would love to go to lunch with you. Where do you want to go? And he says, I want to take you to someplace really special. I want to take you to Casa Rio on the San Antonio Riverwalk. And I say, Richard, I'm not in San Antonio. He says, Reagan, if you want the free lunch, you have to come to San Antonio and get it. Is that a gift? Well, I love a free lunch as much as the next guy, right? But compared to $10,000 Spurs tickets, where are we going to put it on the graph? It's a much, much smaller gift, isn't it? But what conditions are placed upon me? I have the exact same conditions as Greg had for those Spurs tickets. I have to take a day off of work. I have to drive to San Antonio. I probably have to get a hotel room while I am there. And so the exact same conditions with a much smaller gift, it's not a gift. I mean, let's be honest. If I drive to San Antonio to have, Rich, have lunch with Richard, I'm really do, doing Richard a favor, aren't I? Here's the point of all this. The greatness of the gift that we have been given by grace in Jesus Christ of our salvation, everything that God has done to bring about your salvation and mine, if we were to try and plot it on some chalkboard, I think that way's north, we could just keep going north, go through the United States, go into Canada, go into the Arctic Circle. There are not enough chalkboards available to show us how great that gift is. That the Son of God left His throne in glory to come and die at the hands of sinful men for sinful men. And the only condition that could possibly be placed upon that gift that would negate its status as a gift is perfection. Absolute and complete perfection. That is the only way I could possibly stand before God and say, you know what, I don't need the gift that you've given me. I deserve to go to heaven. Anything, anything that God asks of us is worth it. Any work, any condition that He asks is worth it because of the greatness of the gift. And even if God were to say to me, Reagan, you have to go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come follow me, we should be willing to do it because that's how great the gift is. And even if He says, in comparison to your love for me, it has to be as if you hate father and mother and wife and children, and yes, your own life also, we should be willing because that's how great the gift is. And even if He says, repent... And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Show me the water. I'm willing to do it because that's how great the gift is. You know what bothers me so much? Is when people come to me in the course of a study... And they say, Reagan, you just don't appreciate God's grace. I know my sin better than anybody else. I know that I am not justified before God because of what I have done. I know what He has done for me to save me. And to say that we can put no conditions on God's grace or else it is no longer a gift, it underestimates how great that gift truly is. You know, the Apostle Paul understood this. He understood it maybe better than most. If you turn over to the book of Philippians, notice what he says in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7. Anything that God requires of us is so little in comparison to what He is offering to give us 
And so that's why Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, as trash, as dung on the trash heap of life, that I may gain Christ. I'll give anything up, Paul says. And to be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. I didn't earn it, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith, that I might know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death. If, and please notice the next phrase, by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul says, by any means necessary, whatever God asks of me, it is worth it that I might be raised with Christ. Paul says, this is the greatest gift that ever has been, ever will be given, and whatever God requires of us, we should be willing to do it. Amen? But, and I speak especially to my brethren now, Let us not fall into the trap of the devil of thinking somehow that our faithful obedience is somehow co-equal to God's grace. What God has done for us is far, far greater than anything we could ever do for Him. They are not equal in magnitude, but they are both necessary if we are going to be saved by grace through faith, according to the plan of God, which was before the foundation of the world. And so that's why he says what he does in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 9, that this gift that we're given of salvation by grace is not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We cannot save ourselves in that sense. We cannot be so good as to go to heaven. But we need to identify what Paul is talking about here in regard to works. Paul uses works in different ways. We have to look no further than verse 10 to see that. What he is saying is that we cannot be saved by meritorious works like the law of Moses where we say, I work this and then ultimately I've earned it. But that in no way discounts or says that we are not to fulfill the works of faith that God requires of us in order to accept the gift. And where the rubber meets the road. Y'all say that in Alabama? Where the rubber meets the road? Where it all comes to a head especially in our conversations with those people that we love and care about, who love Jesus, so often where it comes to a head is with baptism. What happens when I'm baptized? It's not just a ritual. And so I ask you to turn back to the book of Colossians, and we will end our lesson tonight in the same place where we began our lesson, in the same book. But this time in Colossians chapter 2, he says in verse 1 of chapter 3, If then you were raised with Christ. When does that happen? When do we become a Christian? Notice what he says in verse 11. Actually, verse 12 of chapter 2. He says we are buried with Him, with Christ, in baptism in which you were also raised with Him through faith. Faith in what? Faith in ourselves? Faith in our own works? Look at how good I was baptized. I deserve to go to heaven? No. Through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, and he, which was contrary to us, and He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It is faith, brethren, 
in the working of God that causes us to be baptized. Faith that says, I believe that the same God who raised Jesus from the dead physically can raise me from the dead spiritually if I am buried in water that I might rise to walk in newness of life. However God says for me to do it, I have faith to do it His way because the gift is worth it and I want to receive it. And so, where did this modern idea come from that no works can accompany faith and grace? Well, during the Reformation, men like Martin Luther and John Calvin who were who were intelligent men, who were well-studied men, who knew their Bibles. They looked around at the failed system of Catholicism and they knew some things weren't right. They knew that no one could buy their way into heaven with indulgences. They knew that the Bible didn't teach that. They knew that you couldn't earn your salvation by saying so many Hail Marys or walking up and down the cathedral steps a thousand times. And so they interpreted passages like Ephesians 2 in the context of their biases and they swung too far the other way. In the midst of this works-based salvation that you can earn your salvation, which was the system at the time, instead of stopping and saying, there is nothing that you can do to earn your salvation, which is what I'm trying to say to tonight. They swung too far the other way, and they said there is nothing that God can require of you to accept salvation. Brothers and sisters, that is whittling on God's end of the stick. God is the one who's going to save us by His grace. And God is the one who has the right to tell us how we are going to be saved. God can require whatever He desires. And so God says, even tonight, I can save you. I can save you by my grace. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever you've done in your life, I can save you. And I will save you if, if you have faith, the obedient faith that accepts my grace in the way I require And if you need to do that, even this evening, if you need to accept God's grace in the way He lays forth in the New Testament, there is nothing. It'd make the drive here well worth it. There is nothing that we would love to do more than to help you in that. And we encourage you to do so. Come now, while together we stand and while we sing. Years I spent.